Lord, we would ask that we would not just merely read uh, the words that you have spoken, Lord, but, Lord, that we would take these things into our hearts. Father, that we would be open to your leading. Lord, that when we hear your word, we walk away changed. We walk away renewed. We walk away transformed by the things that you say. And so, Father, now as we approach your word with reverence and with open hearts and open minds to hear what you would have to say, Father, we ask that, Lord, you would make it clear to us, not the things that I speak, Lord, but the things that you have for your people this morning. Open hearts and minds, Father. Help us to understand and to apply your word this morning. For it is in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen. We have been in uh, a series dealing with Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And as part of this, he begins to teach on divorce in chapter 5, verse 31. And here is the text this morning. Jesus says, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. You know, it's interesting that we are discussing the sanctity of human life on a day in which we're also dealing with divorce. Sanctity of human life and the lack of it in this country is a result of disobedience. The lack of respect for human life is a result of disobedience to God's Word and of course divorce is a result of disobedience to God's Word. And disobedience always, always leads to tragedy. Whether it's the death of a child or the death of a relationship Disobedience to God's word always ends in tragedy. And this morning, I want to share with you the magnitude of the marriage message. The magnitude of the marriage message. Because you see, marriage carries with it an inherent message. Every marriage carries with it a message to the world, a message to the people that are watching that marriage. And I'd like to share that with you this morning. Obviously, the theme of our Lord's words deal with divorce, marriage, remarriage, adultery. These are the major factors in society that we live with today. Last week, we discussed uh, uh, some startling divorce statistics, their impact on societies, on families, on children, as well as biblical reasons for why marriage is so inherently difficult. Because you see, after the fall, as a result of the curse, which is brought about by sin, marriage has become very difficult. Last week, we focused primarily on the man's responsibility within the marriage and how he must love, honor, respect, serve, sacrifice for his wife. And we ended our study last week with a focus on the marriage of the Lamb, how that in heaven, Jesus will have a a wedding ceremony in which he marries his church, his bride. With the picture of Christ as the bridegroom and the church as his bride. And this morning, we want to pick up where we left off last Sunday. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, where the apostle Paul uh, is giving us God's view of marriage, he said, Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, immediately as we read that passage, we already face the fact that marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. And that's obvious from verse 22 and 23. Further, in verse 24, it says, Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject to their husbands in everything. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And then he talks about, uh, uh, when you come down to verse uh, 32, 
Uh, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. In other words, marriage becomes a symbol defining for us in visible terms the relationship between Christ and his church. And so the relationship that Christ has to his church is precisely what our marriages should be, what our marriages should reflect, what our marriages should show to the world. And it's for this reason that husbands are to be faithful to their wives, even as Christ is faithful to his church, and wives are to be faithful uh, to their husbands as well. This is the imagery we find in Ephesians. And when we understand this, when we understand that our marriages are more than just a, a, a relationship of convenience between two people, when we understand that the real purpose, the core purpose, the heart of marriage, in fact, the marriage message itself is to show forth the picture of Christ in the kingdom, then we go to a little bit different level in our marriages. When we understand this, it lifts marriage out of purely the human dimension into a divine perspective. Because marriage is a symbol of the relationship between Christ and His church, and not an end in itself. Did you know that marriage, did you know that marriage was not primarily designed for your happiness? <laughs> Some guy says, yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> but marriage was not simply designed for our happiness. Marriage was designed to honor God, to glorify God. Marriage is an illustration on a human level of a divine relationship. And when you and I miss, when you and I have a lack of perspective of this highest purpose of marriage... That's perhaps why we find many Christians, even Christians, divorcing. And in fact, divorcing at the same rate as the heathens. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. This is again that same beautiful imagery that a believer is united to Christ in the image of a marriage. And of course in Revelation 19 and 21 the church is seen as the bride of Christ and the city where the church dwells is seen as the, the bride city and joined together with the bridegroom. And so all this lovely imagery of the New Testament points out that marriage is a symbol of Christ and his bride and as such must be, and catch this, as such it must be permanent. If marriage is to be a symbol of Christ's love for his people, then marriage must be permanent. And in Genesis 2, 23 through 24, we find marriage to be between two people becoming one for life with no intention of divorce. Malachi 2, 16 says, as we saw last Sunday, for the man who does not love his wife but divorces her, says the Lord, the God of Israel, covers his garments in violence, says the Lord of hosts. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless, he says. And so the Old Testament lays down this standard again and again, and the standard never changes. Marriage is for life. Divorce was never, ever intended by God. Divorce is never God's way to resolve any conflict. Never, never. And that's why God never commands divorce, and God never condones divorce in the Bible. God knows it will happen. And so he tries to regulate its consequences, but he never commands it as a solution. I'd like to share with you this morning a foundation for faithfulness. I'd like to give you a foundation for faithfulness in your marriage. Perhaps no book in the Bible illustrates this truth of marriage and the permanence of marriage better than the book of Hosea. If you've ever read the book of Hosea, uh, Hosea is the first of what is known as the minor prophets in the Old Testament. Not minor because they have an unimportant message, but minor simply in the sense that they're shorter, but the message is major. Major. 
And Hosea, the first of the minor prophets, presents us with perhaps the most clear Old Testament view of exactly how God views marriage. Marriage was designed to illustrate God's relationship with people, and here he does it beautifully. Now here's the situation. There came a time when the Lord appeared to one of his servants by the name of Hosea. And God's design as he approached Hosea was that Hosea would become a prophet. Only the prophecy that Hosea was going to give would not be a verbal prophecy or not be only a verbal prophecy. But Hosea's life itself would become a living human example, a living human object lesson. Now listen to what the Lord does through Hosea. Hosea's life would become a living drama to illustrate the great spiritual truth of marriage to the world. Now here's the situation. Hosea was told by God to marry a woman by the name of Gomer. As if that isn't bad enough. Um, He then tells Hosea to marry her. And then, of course, after he marries her, he would discover that she became a prostitute. And in spite of that, he was to be faithful to his marriage vow to her. No matter what the pain, no matter what the consequence, no matter what the price, no matter what the unfaithfulness, no matter how excruciating his humiliation would be, no matter how unfaithful she was, no matter what the price was to be paid, he was to remain faithful. He was to remain faithful to his debauched, vile whore of a wife, no matter what she did. Why? (laughs) Why? Because this was a pageant to demonstrate how faithful God would be to his wayward wife, Israel. And it sets for us the standard of relationship in a marriage as it is the image of God's relationship to his people. Folks, if marriage is supposed to be an image of how God loves his people, and if Hosea is a uh, a portrayal of how God loves his people, then marriage should be held to the same standard. In other words, God has espoused himself to Israel as a husband in the Old Testament. God had taken Israel to be his wife, a permanent relationship, And by the way, in the future, God will yet restore the wayward wife of Israel. Even as Romans 11 says, and bring Israel to the kingdom that he promised at the beginning. But at this time, Hosea was to dramatize the fact that she was committing adultery on a spiritual level with false gods. The heart of the story is that Hosea was to be faithful and a forgiving husband no matter what she did. In fact, as we go into the story, the interesting thing is that we find out that when she went into harlotry, that her husband Hosea actually followed her around as she went from lover to lover. Followed her around and would pay her debts for her. Make sure she had everything provided for. Make sure she's okay while she's actively involved in her sin. He follows her around and pays her debts. And Romans chapter 3 verse 3 says this. What if some are unfaithful? Does their unfaithfulness nullify the faithfulness of God? The point is that God's unchanged love for Israel is based on a permanent promise he made, which is based upon his character and not her actions. So even though Israel became a harlot, God said, I'll bring her back. I'll bring her back. How does Jesus treat the church? How does Jesus treat you? Have you ever failed Christ? Have you ever turned your back on Him? Have you ever turned away? Have you ever committed spiritual adultery against the one who is your bridegroom? 
Has he ever turned you away? No, never. Don't you see? Don't you see the point that this is how a Christian marriage partner is to respond to an unfaithful spouse, no matter what the sin, no matter what the problem. The instant reaction should be forgiveness. And so here's Hosea following along behind his bride while she commits her prostitution, paying her bills, caring for her. You say, ah, but Hosea's nuts. He's lost it. And I'm sure the people in his hometown thought he was nuts too. What kind of guy is this? What kind of guy would do this? I mean, don't you have any self-respect? I mean, I've seen love, but this is stupid. But you see, Hosea is saying to us what God is saying to us. This is, God says, how I love you. This is how I love you. This is my heart for my people. You may run away from me, but you'll never outrun my love. On the one hand, it's amazing how in the Christian life when we sin, God sustains us on the one hand and yet chastens us also on the other hand. He covers our sin on the one hand and punishes us in order to bring us back at the same time. So Hosea, while he kept on loving Gomer... She finally got to the point where she reached rock bottom. She was in fact so debauched, so defiled, that she wound up for sale on the slave block, on the slave market as a slave. And that's where we find her in Hosea chapter 3. So what did Hosea do? He walks in. I can imagine his friends talking, hey, have you heard your wife's for sale over there? I think I'll go pick her up. It's a pretty good deal. Can you imagine the humiliation? And so Hosea goes to the slave block and there he sees his wife for sale. And again, the one whom he loved the one whom he followed through all of her harlotries while paying her debts, she now stands before him and before everyone for sale, humiliated. If ever a man had a right to divorce someone, this was the guy. This was the case. Open and shut, no question, no doubt, he's got a right to divorce her. Clean cut. No one would say a word if he divorced her. And the bidding begins for his wife. And he bids along with everyone else for his own wife. And finally in verse 2 he says, So I bought her for myself for 15 pieces of silver and a homer of barley and a half a homer of barley. Now that, by the way, is a tremendous price that he paid, a tremendous price, tremendous amount of money. And after buying her, he says to her, you gotta, you got to hear what he says to her, I am yours, stay with me. <laughs> I am yours, stay with me. Now wait a minute, Hosea, no one can forgive like that. Hosea, you're just a glutton for punishment. Haven't you learned your lesson a hundred times with this woman? Uh, But you see, there's more here than just a man and a woman. There's God and Israel involved here. There's God and His people, and that's why I'm trying to get you to see with marriage. What I'm trying to get you to see this morning is that your marriage, yes, yours, is designed by God as a picture to the world around you. For them to see an example of how much God loves His church. God's standard is our foundation for faithfulness. God keeps His covenant. Christ keeps His covenant. How about you and your marriage? Have you ever thought of divorce? If you have, perhaps you've missed the point. You see, God makes no promises that He breaks regardless of what anyone else does. Christ makes no promises that He breaks. 
and we are to make no promises that we break. And this, folks, is why God hates divorce. Because divorce breaks a promise and it destroys, it destroys, it eliminates, it obliterates the whole beautiful image that Christ is trying to create. That's why God hates divorce, because divorce breaks a promise. And then it breaks the marvelous illustration of marriage pointing toward God and His people. Now, when you can love your spouse like that, when you can love your spouse like like Hosea, then you understand the magnitude of marriage. Then you understand the magnitude of the marriage message. Now, the Jews of Jesus' day, The Jews of Jesus' day didn't see it that way. In fact, they missed the point of Hosea entirely. They missed the point of Genesis. They taught that divorce was really no big deal. They taught the people to whom Jesus uh, came and and spoke thought that divorce was just no big deal, much like today. You know, if it just really isn't working out, it's kind of tough. You know, I get it. It gets tough sometimes. Just just be out of it. It's easy that way. Just, Just be done with it. And that's why Jesus in Matthew 5.31 confronts them with the truth. The truth of God's Word. Jesus is confronting the hypocritical religion of the Pharisees and the scribes and the people who followed their teaching and is saying to them, this is not at all what God ever intended. And we have three things we have to understand about this passage we have to understand that the, t- uh, the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees, for one thing. Then we have to understand the teaching of the Old Testament and the teaching of the New Testament. And as we uh, uh, go through last week and this week and the next week, we'll cover all three. I was shocked recently to hear of a well-known pastor, if I mentioned his name, you'd know him, a well-known pastor who received the following letter in his mailbox. Quote, My husband is walking out in February, or my husband walked out in February and called two weeks later to tell me he wanted a divorce and that God had given him perfect peace about it. And it was surely God's will that we divorce. He tried to convince me that God allowed divorce because of the feeling of love was gone and therefore we were no longer compatible. And our ex-pastor told him that if he wasn't in love with me and saw no hope for our marriage, that he ought to get a divorce. And the Christian marriage counselor that he was working with told him the very same thing. But you see, that's no different. That's not surprising because it's no different than what the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching, what they believed. Just get a divorce. Just make sure you do your paperwork, as was their only stipulation. Just make sure you got that certificate. Did you know that in certain Muslim countries, all you have to do in order to get a legal binding divorce is say to your wife, three times, I divorce you. I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. Done. Painless, huh? In the final moments of our study this morning, I'd like us to look briefly at the true teaching of Moses. Because you see, at about this time, there come those that say, inevitably, just as the Pharisees did, whoa, 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 wait a minute, pastor. Didn't you read Deuteronomy? How about Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, where where God allows divorce? How about that passage? Did we just bypass that or something? I want you to see these four verses. This is the only place in the Old Testament that these Pharisees went to for a source uh, as far as their subject on uh, divorce. Uh, Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4, and it says this, When a man takes a wife and marries her, if she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, 
And if he writes her certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, and if she departs out of the house, and if she goes and becomes another man's wife, and the later man hates her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of the house, or if the latter man dies, who, uh, who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away may not take her again to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that is an abomination to the Lord. They took this passage and said, Aha! See, God allows for divorce. Divorce is okay. Just give her the bill of divorce and and you're good. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. Do you remember that from the beginning God hates divorce? This is why Jesus said, from the beginning it was not so. You are not going to find, as much as you look, you're not going to find any section in the Bible where God says, you know, if there's something wrong with your wife, just write her a bill of divorce and you're okay. Because that would be completely inconsistent with what God says everywhere else in Scripture. It wouldn't match up with Malachi 2, it wouldn't match up with Hosea, it wouldn't match up with Genesis 2, 23 and 24, it wouldn't match up with Mark 19, or Matthew 19, it wouldn't match up with Mark 1. So we've got to look at this from what it actually means. Let me begin here and explain to you briefly what this means. The bill of divorcement this, this was speaking about, the bill of divorcement or the writing of divorcement was never ever designed by God. It wasn't His invention. We don't find that anywhere in the Bible. God didn't invent it. God didn't prescribe it. God certainly didn't command it. Jesus only recognized that it existed. God recognized in Deuteronomy that it existed. He recognized the fact that such a thing made by man, a human invention called a bill of divorce, exists. And so he deals with it on that level. Jesus recognized, God recognized that such a thing exists. And in Matthew 19, 7, here comes the scribes and the Pharisees and they say, well, why did Moses command to give a writing of divorce and divorce her? And here was Jesus' reply. He said unto them, uh, Moses, uh, 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 give a writing of divorce to her. Now, why did he say this? He says, because he permitted it because of the hardness of your hearts. Because of the hardness of your hearts, he permitted you to divorce. But from the beginning, it was not so. In other words, it's not a command. It was simply permission based on what was already going on. Nowhere does God ever command someone to get a divorce. And then, as if that weren't clear enough, just in case someone like misunderstood or something, Jesus explains what he was teaching by saying, what God has joined together, let no man, no man set apart. God's design is simply this, no divorce, period, just no divorce. God prohibited divorce and God hates divorce under any and all circumstances. However, God knew that in a cursed world where sin existed and relationships were strained because of the curse itself, that divorce would be a reality. And so God simply explains that when divorce does happen, there had to be certain things that followed. God was trying to, here's what he was trying to do in this passage. He was trying to regulate the consequences of divorce. Nowhere will you find on any page of the Bible God condoning or commanding divorce. It's never a divine sanction. It's just that God knows it exists because of human sinfulness and rebellion and Jesus recognizes that it exists. Let me give you an illustration. You say, well, what's the difference really? It's like this. It's similar to a judge saying, you come before a judge, justice of the peace, and the judge says, look, if a man commits a felony, he can't be allowed to carry a weapon. Or, for example, a judge saying something like, if a man is convicted of a sex crime, 
then he must continually register his address with the authorities. It would be the same as someone coming and saying, Aha! You see that? The judge is talking about it's okay to commit a sex crime. What? No, no, no. He's saying, look, look, look. (laughs) If he does, if that man does that, then he must not do thus and so. And that's exactly what this is doing. These stipulations cannot be interpreted as the judge condoning a crime, but merely explaining what must happen if the crime is committed. The provision given by Moses is the same. It is simply a socio-political feature to give a writing of divorcement and to regulate the inevitable results if it wasn't given. Legal ramifications of divorce had to be addressed in this passage because marriage was a legal contract. And so when people were shedding their spouses left and right and becoming adulterous, when the innocent party was just uh, turned loose, they could make no claim for anything. So no one would know what the circumstances were. They would not be able to explain their situation. And so this is why he said give a bill of divorce. What was the purpose of the bill of divorce? It was this. It was a testimonial to the woman, to the woman of her freedom from a marital obligation to the husband who divorced her. Next, the bill of divorcement was a statement that the woman was set free by the man so that she would not be accused of being a harlot in that society. She wouldn't also be accused of forsaking her home or running from her husband. And so to ease the burden and to regulate future uh, behavior, there was a writing of divorcement mentioned in Scripture. And the Pharisees took this and twisted it to make it sound as though Moses was commanding divorce. Nonsense. Secondly, the writing of divorcement was evidence for a new husband of the woman's legal freedom to remarry. And by the way, remarriage, in every passage in the Bible that ever mentions divorce, remarriage is always assumed. It is assumed that the woman would remarry. And it's assumed in Deuteronomy and Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. So the bill of divorcement gave legal freedom to the woman to remarry. Thirdly, it is a protection for the woman's reputation to keep her from being slandered as a prostitute. Now, As far as God was concerned, such a writing of divorcement was only legitimate in one case. Only one case. And that one case was in the case of adultery. But even then, divorce was not necessary and was certainly not ideal. When Hosea had an adulterous wife, he didn't divorce her. When we are adulterous toward God, he doesn't divorce us. It's never, ever God's solution Because if both people would get right with God, the marriage would work. The marriage would become right too. All you have in the Bible is the case of Matthew 5, verse 32, where there's the word from Jesus. And listen to it, because it explains what we're going to see here, what we see already in Deuteronomy. I say to you, whoever shall put away his wife, or divorce his wife, except for the cause of fornication, will then cause her, when she remarries, to commit adultery. And whoever marries her that is divorced, commits adultery. See, that's what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is trying to do is stop, he's trying to stop us from adding the sin of adultery to divorce. Do you see that? Now we'll see this in even more detail next time. But the point is this, adultery is the only grounds for writing a bill of divorcement. But they, the Pharisees, were giving bills of divorcement for anything under the sun. Now, technically, technically, if you've got an unfaithful wife or an unfaithful husband, you can chuck them and move on. You can do that. But in so doing, you bring about a divorce. And God always hates divorce because divorce is never the best solution. To love and forgive is always the better way. So having understood this, let's go back to Deuteronomy 24. Now Moses gives us uh, the Old Testament standard. Now I want you to notice this. He gives an illustration here to point out the evil of divorce. He's not trying to provide for it. He's actually trying to prevent it. And here it comes. Now here's the illustration. A man takes a wife and it comes to pass that he doesn't like her anymore because he's found uncleanness in her. 
Now, I want you to notice the word uncleanness here. The word uncleanness here doesn't mean adultery, but some form of shameful, indecent exposure. The root in the Hebrew is to be naked or improper or indecent, obnoxious. The whole thing reads like this. And I want you to, I want you to notice how this should read. The literal way that this should read. If a man takes a wife, and if he marries her, and if it comes to pass she finds fa- uh, no favor in his eyes, and if he has found some uncleanness, and if he writes her a bill of divorce, and if he gives it in her hand, and if she, he sends her out of the house, and if she departs out of the house, and if she goes and marries another person, then she can't come back and marry her first husband. That's Deuteronomy. That's what it's saying. That's what it's teaching. That's the whole point. And that's exactly what Moses is teaching. There is only one legitimate cause for divorce, but it's only a legalistic technicality. It's never the ideal. So this passage is simply giving us an illustration. Here's a man. He takes a wife. He decides to get rid of his wife because he's a sinful man. He gets rid of his wife. He decides to write her a bill of divorcement. And he puts her out of the house. She goes and marries someone else. And later the, uh, the husband hates her and he gives her a divorce. And he sticks it in her hand and he sends her out of the house where he dies. Then she cannot come back and marry her first husband. Why? Because she's been defiled. How can she... How did she get defiled? She got defiled by consummating a new union when she had no grounds to get out of the first one. And you can't marry someone who's defiled. So what Moses is trying to say is don't marry someone who is defiled by adultery. He's not advocating divorce here. And he says there's only one basic ground for divorce and that's adultery. Now when you go back to Matthew chapter 5, our text this morning, Matthew chapter 5, the words of Jesus, we'll close with this. We find precisely what our Lord says to be simply a re-echoing of exactly what Moses said. I say to you, whoever shall put his wi- uh, away his wife except for the cause of fornication, and we'll, by the way, next week get into what that means, will cause her to commit adultery, which in effect, as Deuteronomy 24 says, will defile her. Whoever marries her will also, have this, uh, will also commit adultery. In other words, if you get a divorce on the wrong reasons, you will add adultery to the sin of wrongful divorce. God never advocates divorce. God allows it in the case of adultery. And in any other case, it is sin and leads only to another sin. So both the Lord Jesus Christ and Moses, God himself, are endeavoring to prevent the further sin of adultery being added to the inevitable, uh, or being added when the inevitable remarriage occurs. And there you have it, in simple terms, the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees, the reiteration of the teaching of Moses, and then what Jesus has to say on it. And of course, next time we'll go deeper into what Jesus has to say. We're going to bring it right down next time to the New Testament age so that you can see exactly how it applies to you. In summary, it's this. God made man and woman to marry, to permanently, eternally, forever be one, regardless of what happens. God wanted an absolute commitment of body and soul for life. God hates divorce, not some of it, Not sometimes, all of it, all the time. It's never his will, but he does recognize that it is an inevitable reality in a society filled with sin. And in certain cases, God will allow divorce as a technicality, as in the case of adultery, but it is not necessary. And the scribes and the Pharisees perverted it, and Jesus clarified it. God hates divorce. He hates it. Will you pray with me this morning? Our Father, these are difficult things to hear.
These are difficult things to read from your word. These are difficult things to understand for many. And yet, Lord, your primary message is very clear. Lord, help us to be faithful in our marriages. Help us, Lord, to fulfill your perfect plan. Thank you, Father, that you've given us in the power and strength of your Holy Spirit living inside us the ability to fulfill our marriage vows. Lord, help us to keep those vows that we made to our partners so that our marriages can be to the world a picture of Christ's love for the church. And Father, right here, right now, I ask that you would bless and nourish every marriage within our New Hope family. Strengthen every marriage here. Lord, strengthen the bonds of our relationship to our spouses. Help us, Father, to, as we live out our marriages, to be a picture of your love for us. And, Father, above all this morning, as we listen to the difficult things that you have to say, Lord, above all, may we surrender our will to yours. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.